I got a note. Um, I got a note from someone on your team like 30 minutes ago on LinkedIn saying what say yeah hey, we ran into a meet I, because i tell my team i gotta go don't you think that i've done my work i'm gonna do a podcast says which one says great says, oh my god it's great we love that yeah uh medicine grass yes 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 oh, she's, she's an AE on the team i awesome, don't man. even think i've ever met her in person she's just a, a oh fan. you have fans you have fans so yeah. weird so weird. I, I was uh, at some point, I think the gong team messaged me asking for the raw audio files of an episode that I did with Longfield or something uh, for onboarding. Uh, who knows? Oh, wow. Who knows? Cool. Anyway, I'm thrilled to be doing it. Um, I want you closer to the mic. All right. Um, yeah. I, yeah. That, like that. That's good. That's good. Is that fair? Or I could, should I move the mic? Yeah, or? Move, the mic. yeah move it closer. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah, yeah. Do you know that I started my, my first job was like in, in professional audios and recording studios? Are you serious? Oh, uh, dead serious. I, I'm like kind of, um, I'm like kind of an audiophile when it comes to this thing. Like I'm a little bit of a nut when it comes to audio quality because most podcasts actually don't have good audio quality. Right. And I find that very annoying. Like I'm investing an hour plus of time with get, like, right. whoever the host is. Right. And, like, I just feel like the least you could do is give me something that's nice on the ears. Right. It makes like a, like a much better experience for people. Is that not fair? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, I hear you're boosting the bass a little bit. I'm boosting, right? I'm boosting, I'm boosting, a your, presence, I'm yeah. boosting your side a little bit. Am I yeah. loud on your headphones or do I sound okay? No, it's perfect. Okay. Yeah. I have, I tend to have, um, a caring voice. Do people? It's a meet. Yes, but everybody must say a meet. Uh, uh, unless you're from India. Uh huh. So Indian. It's also an Indian name. I'm, I'm Israeli. Uh, people from India. A meet is apparently like a thing over there. And I was like, you know, when we get on Zoom, right, or something. Oh, you're not Indian, right? Uh, uh yeah. So uh, sorry to disappoint, but it's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Do so you, people from India pronounce it actually pretty well, but most people would say like Amit or something. Yeah. Or Amit or something. Yeah. Do you have the heart to correct them? Like I, I yeah. don't, but I also know that people want me to correct them when it's like Jubin, but you know, they, they, I don't, to me, people can call it whatever they want. It's doesn't totally matter. cool. I, I do. If I get on call, something that I don't know how to pronounce is like, uh, do I pronounce your name? So I ask, like, if, if me talk about some to someone else, yeah. I would definitely ask him about it. Me, I don't care. Like, it's and fun. are you intentional about remembering their names? Yes, I. So we have about like twelve hundred fifty people in the company. So, and I take we have like captain's table, which I take them like breakfast, lunch, or dinner, something like a few meals a day. So all my meetings, I have like pictures, names, what they do, how long they've been in the company, who's their manager. Uh, and I memorize that. So before the meeting, I'll remember the name. I'll say it aloud and I try to me- give everybody that experience that they, every uh, meeting, every meeting. So your team assistant, whoever it is, will literally she prepare. Yeah, I can show you. She prepares a document for me. Um, and it has like everybody's, uh, here. This is from, um, Uh, from uh, Friday, uh, I'll show you like uh, captain's uh, captain's table. What does captain's table mean? Captain's table, uh, like I I go out and take like five or six team members from different corners of the company just to talk. Give you like SDRs. Wherever support. you are, whatever office you're in. Wherever you are. If there's in a Dublin, hub. we do it there. In Tel Aviv, I do it sometimes in my house, sometimes in an office here. We just go to places. So... She'll prepare a file for me. You can see like every every meeting I have that. And I, on my way, I read it and I, I memorize everything. No kidding. Yeah. And you are very intentional SDR to SVP. You're going to remember their name. Well, SVPs, I remember the names. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's the SDRs. And uh, with so many people in the company, it's uh, very hard. And uh, the things that you're looking at just based on this are job, time at Gong, who do they work for? Yeah. Is the who do they work for? Do you do that because you want to ask them questions about their boss? No, I don't ask them questions. Usually the, the, it's an opportunity for them to ask me a question. Just give me like, I know what team they are. They're in commercial, they're just in enterprise. Just, just help me orient like, you know, what's 
what's their context, right? It's their worldview. Where is it coming from? What was the uh, what was what was the tipping point for you, where you started to need that in the company? Uh, well, usually this this like. Um, number of like 120 yeah uh there's right? a name right. for it yeah so there's yeah i remember that that uh, that constant and um so i did and i did it like previous companies before when i was ceo i take people like one-on-one and walk and talk right you just walk for an hour and mm-hmm. talk about everything from mm-hmm. uh, uh you know meaning of life to work to professional career just get to know each other mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's like a captain's table, mm-hmm. which I do. It's like, you know, you know, two or three times a week. Uh, there's now so in virtual something called like party of six. We do the same thing over Zoom for people that can't attend in person and a lot of other opportunities. And, and uh, it just helps you uh, communicate and connect the company in a much better way. Why do you do that? Why do you do the captain's table? Um, like you're pretty busy, man. You got a lot of competing priorities for you to take, you know, an entry level, an entry level person that came straight out of college. I don't know. You have a name for it. It's programmatic. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's like you spend uh, time preparing. We, we for have it. a full program. We have like a, a captain's log, which are a Slack channel. We, we, you know, I send picture what's happening with my life. What's happening with other team members. There's captain's table party of six. What can talk? It is, um, it is important as a company grows. And again, you can't talk with everybody, but you know, if I talk to certain people, right, they'll talk to some of their friends and some of their colleagues and, and it, it helps like communicate what the company priorities are, help them like surface like concerns or questions that they have. And at Gong, we have one of our leadership principles is called like no royalty, right? You're supposed to be able to communicate uh, with anybody in a company. You don't have to go through like chains of command. Uh, you're now better than anybody. Yeah, we, you're, you're more senior in your organization. There is structure, but it's not that the uh, medicine that we spoke about, right? She started as an SDR. She's amazing. She's climbing up. And, you know, we we had like our first walk and talk, I think, in our in our kickoff, right? And it's like, uh, and that's how you grow the people. You help them understand what the company is about, what we're doing, what are the challenges, what are the priorities, and uh, and next time that they need something, they feel free to uh, to connect with me, right? Because they're they know me. In a in a walk and talk, let's imagine it's thirty minutes. How much are you talking versus listening? Um, as I'm talking as much as I'm being asked. Yeah. Right. And sometimes I ask questions, and yeah. usually I don't ask people about work. I I would try to you know what's going on, like how you're doing, what are the challenges. So I, I would I will ask, but sometimes it's career advice. It's um, and, um, I don't know, maybe we need gong for that so we can measure my talk time and the, uh, the questions. That's right. That's right. Well, look, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you here. I have heard so much. We've overlapped several different times in really random places. And so to have you here at the KP office, it means a lot. So thank you. My pleasure. Um, I'm curious what, um, what was the first job you ever had? As an adult? Someone, no, uh, the first time someone paid you. Didn't even have to be in W2 paid. format. Um, so as a teenager, I did like summer jobs. I was like uh, working in a mail room, like filling envelopes with mail. My mom worked for an insurance company, so I was doing that. I was like sorting like bulbs at a, at a, at a farm. You know, I quit after a day because like, oh, it was terrible. <laughs> and my first job... I was like selling at a retail store, like, uh, it, uh, you know, I was born and raised in Israel and I was working at a guitar store, kind of like, uh, um, like a guitar center here. Mm-hmm. And I was just selling. Hmm. And you were the first in your family to go to college? Uh, yes, yes. I have a very large family. I, um, you know, my parents didn't go to, uh, to college. Like most of my family, we come from a very humble background, kind of uh-huh. like a, a lower middle class, working class. Uh, and, uh, I was, I was the first. Huh. It wasn't, it wasn't obvious. It wasn't even like expected. It's not that someone told me you need to go to it just kind of like a, a desire. And this is in Israel. Yeah. That's a little surprising to me because Israeli culture is not too dissimilar from my culture, from Persian culture, which is very education oriented. Right. So help me understand that. Like, I, I, I'm surprised to hear that, to be honest. No, I was I was educated. You know, I definitely went to school. I read a lot as a child. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was like, you know, uh, 
a rich supply of, of books that I read like since early age. But again, it wasn't, you know, you and again, we're talking like uh, like a while ago. Mm -hmm. So today it's different. Like everybody goes to college. But back when I grew up, no, it wasn't necessarily assumed or expected. You didn't have to. I think I would have. I think I would be shellacked if I didn't go to college. I think that I think I wouldn't be. I wouldn't have. Uh, So when I wanted to go to high school and, you you know, in Israel, you have you could go to like general high school, go to like a vocational to learn. So. But actually, you know, maybe go like learn electronics. So, you know, you'll have like a profession, right? Whatever you do, you have a job. I didn't, but. Uh, and your family still lives in Israel? Yeah. You live in Israel. I live in Israel. So my wife, my two boys and I, I pretty much commute to uh, San Francisco. You spend half your time here? Uh, yeah. I spend half of my time here and I spend about a month a year on airplanes. That's crazy. A full month. You calculated it? Yeah, my son actually uh, calculated that I do uh, like 400, uh, 400, I think like kilometers a year or miles, whatever, which is like the distance to the moon. One way. Pretty, Every year. Pretty. And then the second year, you could see like it's on my way back from the moon. Yeah. <laughs> any, um, over time, any good travel tips that you've, that you've developed? Anything that you do to stay sharp? People ask me a lot, uh, you know, how do you deal with the jet lag and all of that? First, I, I just do it, right? You get on an airplane, you land. Uh, but I I try to stay like pretty healthy. I eat healthy. Mm. I exercise a ton. Uh, and then, um, you know, managing like uh, light, uh, your, your kind of circadian circle. And um, I don't drink alcohol like on days when I fly, so I don't take like the, uh, uh, the you know, the cocktails on airplane is anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, a little bit of from a melatonin, sometimes an ambient to help sleep, which mm-hmm. is important. I work out hard on days of the travel. Same. So when I get on the plane, I'm, I'm just Exhausted. dead. Right. So I have to fall asleep. Yeah. So you're sleeping on the plane ride generally. You're yes. not trying to work. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. I was, um, so I spoke with your wife. She's a sweetheart. You're nervous about her. You're nervous about (laughs) her conversation. I, uh, I mean, I promised her that, um, that I wouldn't share everything. So maybe you can can share. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, one picture that, uh, my team printed for me, uh, is, uh, is this, do you know what this is? Oh yeah. 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 It's a, uh, it's a reminder to, what is this? So this is, I was going on air. Uh, I think it's like, uh, um, like with NASDAQ, uh-huh. they interview me live, live broadcast. And, uh, and I have Dan Race, who's our, um, head VP of communications. He's kind of my coach, right? And, and we always like rehearse this stuff. And he said like two things you need to do. Like remember to smile and slow. I tend to speak fast, right? And sometimes it's hard for people to understand. So slow down, break the senses. So that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, why I, you see, I'm talking a little fast right now, huh. but I put these like two post-its. So I, I remember them and always have them in front of me and look at the camera is like the, uh, the third thing. Do you, um, do you, th- do you find it tricky with, I assume English was your second language? Yes. Do you, is that an insecurity? Do you have that in, because so much of your job is the chief communications officer right. of Gong. I don't know. Sometimes it is, it is sometimes. Yeah. It's a little bit because it, it definitely, um, I have a lot of typos sometimes because I type super fast and I don't even like bother to read. And then, uh, so definitely like, when I like write, proofread your emails. Yeah I, yeah. I, I don't sometimes. And, and I know, you know, I'm okay with that. Right. Hopefully people understand he's not just dumb, right? It's, uh, it's just typing fast. Um, and when I speak, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you never know where you're saying something that, you know, doesn't sound right, but I know that kind of, um, I hope that, you know, something is that, you know, what I say or kind of the energy or the content of my message, like, uh, uh, outweighs the deficiencies in my speech. Mm-hmm. Um, on the, uh, on the splitting time between here and Israel, I'm fascinated. By the way, when I come to Israel, can we go out to dinner? Like that, to one of your well, favorite restaurants? Absolutely. Yeah. I am, I am obsessed with Israel. I food. would love that. Yeah. I'm, you're my guest. I'm obsessed. Um, how do you negotiate that with your family? Like that is a very tricky balance. It is, it is very because tricky. Just yeah. to be clear, when you're home for half the year, you're still working. Like, it's not like just because you're home now, you, you, you know? Yeah. In my profession, it's like, it's pretty much 24 on seven. Uh, you, you, you're always working. 
um, to some degree in Israel, I actually work harder because because of the time zone. So in Israel, I have like a day job, which I go to the office in Tel Aviv. And then at night, I start the call with California, right? Mostly like West Coast and East Coast. So I, I work more hours when I'm in Israel. I work like fewer hours, at least uh, with people like when I'm here. And, um, you know, before we started Gong, Gong is kind of the fourth company that I'm leading. And we didn't need to do that, like financially or anything. And, and, uh, and, but I had this idea, right, for a company. And we, the four of us, uh, uh, Sarit and the two boys, we had a discussion. And, uh, dad had this thing. He wants to start. <laughs> A new company, you know, how do you feel about it? And, uh, and, you know, it's going to be more travel, but, uh, but, uh, you know, they're supportive. And so it's a passion and a profession. And we try to make up by that quality time that we do meet together. We do communicate. So, you know, my younger son is a big football fan. So now we're, you know, we're watching FIFA together, quote unquote, right? He's there. I'm here. And we're kind of texting to, uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, discuss the games. So we try to do as much as as much as we can, but it it is definitely a price. I've I've heard you talk about when you were deciding to start the company. You said we started the company, and I thought you meant you and your co-founders, but you were talking about your family. Well, it's me and my co-founder. It's like uh, right, Elon and I. Yeah, but definitely but the family the is part of it. Yeah, that. yeah, you, yeah. If you can't, yeah, if you don't have the family as support, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a very demanding job. It's very hard. Uh, there are a lot of like ups and downs, uh, and and you need to have the support of the family. Without it, it's definitely impossible. And and, um, and how does the conversation go? Is it a very pragmatic view of the demands that this will take on your time and? Pretty much everything. Um, they know. So I've always worked hard. Yeah. Like this is not. Um, so even like when I was an officer in a company, it wasn't my company. I never felt that, you know, this isn't my company. I should be working on this. I was like super committed and super driven and super passionate. So they kind of we know each other very, very well. And it, you know, if anything, like over the years, I've learned to balance it a little more, probably in my twenties and thirties, I, I would, I, I've worked harder. Um, and now you kind of learn to balance. Plus you have like a great team that, that supports you, but it is, um, um, it, it's not like a new idea. Like we all knew, uh, what we're, we're getting into and uh, with the extensive travel, like when the, my previous company was in New York city. So, you know, with, and the kids were younger, so we just spend like a summer together um, in New York, right? So summer vacations, we'll just get like an Airbnb and all this. So I would still work, but we'd get to spend the time together, which is like a big, uh, a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Can you juxtapose the way that folks work in Israel versus here? Is there any difference? Do you see any cultural differences in the way that work is thought of, valued, like I'm just really curious how that's evolved. Um, yeah, yeah, there there are so and 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 even that has like changed um, like in the last few years in a pretty pretty big way, right? So for for us in Israel, first like different personas uh, in Israel, it's mostly like, uh, engineering and uh, and product, which is like a one type of like personality. I mm. mean, I'm stereotyping like very broad yep. strokes. Yep. And here it's mostly like uh, uh, go to market functions, mm. some uh, uh, people in, in, in finance. So, but um, uh, in Israel, we have like an office. Uh, it's, a, it's a very small, it's like a state, right? Even like half a state, it's like Northern California, right? So that's the size. So everybody's like, uh, in the office like a few times a week and there's like it's very communal uh you know we have like hit our lunch you come you come around lunch and it's buzzing right and exploding people really enjoy that um there is um and here it's more scattered now it used to be like that like in you know 2019 and now it's like people are more scattered and just just the sheer size of the geography you know you can't like if you live in colorado you can't be in the office like uh like every day in israel uh you know you're never more than let's say like 
two hours away of, of, of drive time. Right. So, you know, you might not come every day, but it's not a big deal to be at least once a week. Mm-hmm. And in Israel, it's six day work weeks, not five. No, it's five. It's five. It's five. Just different. It's a it shift. It ends up being a six day work yeah. week for Americans that are living in Israel it, because your Monday is Sunday or whatever. No, it it's is. like, it's like a, a Sunday through Thursday. Right. That's the usual. Right. Uh, yeah, it's five days a week. Yeah. Okay. Same, same thing. Do you feel like we've lost a script a little bit here? It's, um, I, I'm asking yeah. you this because you have such a good, you literally split time between these two places. And right. I think the cultures are very different about the way we think about work. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I'm not saying yeah. that I do think that there needs to be more balance on, uh, on the not working side. I'm not arguing that. I just wonder if we've over rotated. Um, well, I think that, um, I, I think that the remote work is, is challenging, especially like in difficult times. Uh, and again, I don't want to like, uh, judgmental because there are pros and cons like working together, like in office or not, but I see kind of the, the kind of like, uh, uh, team support that you're getting. Right. Uh, and again, it's not that you really need to supervise people or they're working nine to five. That never mattered to me. I, I never like look at people like how many hours they're putting in, but mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, what they're doing. Right. And their impact. Um, and, you know, everybody's trusted. But if I'm, let's say, like a young SDR and I just am out of college and it's a very hard job, you're getting like 20 rejections a day. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's crushing. Right. But if you have like people around you that, you know, they all experience the same thing, they can support you. You look around you, you have these like random uh, uh, conversations, you go and have lunch together. That creates a much uh, uh, better environment for success. So in some roles, yeah, you, you could be like if you're like, you know, some kind of like a analyst or a finance director and you could you could work on your own. Some roles, I think we have. Um, we went a little bit too far with the uh, remoteness. Yeah. I worry that over the last two years, because people hired so many folks remote, because so much hiring was happening, because there was an accelerant of digital transformation when everyone was stuck at home. I don't know how you unwind that gracefully. I think that uh, we would probably not fully unwind it. I think that I yeah. think it's here to stay. There's a lot of benefit for that. You know, people can uh, can work where their passion is. I mean, they don't need to commute as much. So it's not it's not bad. Uh, I think we'll shift some of that back for for some roles. And again, gradually. Like, listen, if we have someone at Gong who's fantastic. You know, they work, uh, so we have like people working in Hawaii, right? That was like a lifelong, uh, dream of them and they're super successful and, and, you know, they can do both. And why not? We're not going to say, you know, you come to the office or else. Um, but some roles, like if they're especially like new and, and, uh, teamwork is key, right? And a new group. I mean, for that, you know, we're starting to shift back to uh, in office and we have multiple office. So it gives people like a quite a bit of choice. Yeah. Where they're um, gonna be. I, I totally agree. I'm not going to harp on this too much, but I have some strong thoughts, obviously. Um, so you went to just to rewind before gone, you were at click software for fif- 13 years, 11, I think 11 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. And this is like a defining run of your career. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And this was, were you and your wife living in Boston for this? We started in Israel then, and then we moved to Boston, yeah. And did you have kids yet? We're not. We're just, we just got married and they tell us, hey, can you go and open like the operation in the U.S.? I said, sure, yeah, why not? We thought we we're going for a year. It's kind of like an extended honeymoon and then came back like nine years later with uh, two boys. <laughs> <laughs> was there not conversation about moving to the Bay Area? At that time, uh, we opened an office, like, uh, we opened an office in California and we yeah. started shifting some of the company, but then like we, you know, sort of like the dot com bus. And then it was like, uh, we had to shut down the office, which is like a, de- another defining moment. Uh, you remember like, uh, you know, what happens when you were, when you go crazy. Uh, but no, we, we liked it over there. Uh, somehow we liked the, uh, the cold weather and mm. uh, I'm kidding. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. And then you went to Panaya? 
So, yes, is that right? yes. But I was an Israeli company. We moved back to Israel again, not for professional reasons. We, you know, we love being here, but we wanted the uh, the boys to have like you know grandparents. I think they're uh, kind of priceless. So we it, that was the decision. And you spent five years there. Yes, give or take. Then you went to be the CEO of SciSense, right? Yes, three years there, which is where the idea of 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 Gong kind of struck you. Yeah, as the story goes. Yes, it's true. As the story goes, can you um? Can you tell the can you tell the audience maybe just for framing what does Gong do and maybe you could use a real life example? Yeah, absolutely. So Gong is is an AI platform that captures uh, customers' conversations over email, Zoom, uh, um, telephone, and other media. Uh, uses natural language understanding to understand what is being said, and then turns in like uh, insights. And actions that improve the performance both for sales, customer success, uh, sales development, and also product and marketing. Uh, think of like a like a self organizing uh, customer management system that controls the entire uh, seller process. Mm. Um, I started the company, uh, or not started a company. I got the idea for ultimately beginning going in what I call the quarter from hell. I mm. was feeling like a really bad quarter as the CEO of SciSense. Yes. And we're growing like in a really nice pace. Like everything was on fire. We did like a like a a sizable round in in those days terms at a, a, a lofty valuation. We had like a great quarter. I tell people this is a closing quarter, uh, and you know things were fine. And all of a sudden, like uh, comes July, and sales are kind of slowing down. And we're saying, okay, maybe it's like. You know, summer, people on vacation, and then they're starting to take a nosedive. And I had no idea what was going on. And I called the investor. says, like, listen, I know it looks like odd, you know, but, I'm, you know, there's nothing like funky going on. I'll get to the bottom of it. And I'm starting to ask people, like, what is going on? And I'm hearing all these stories, like, from, uh, you know, sales are obviously blaming the leads, right? Yeah, we have enough leads, but the leads that we're getting right now don't have a sense of urgency. Mm-hmm. Um, their um, marketing is blaming sales. You, you hired like a bunch of rookies, mm-hmm. which was true. We hired a lot of new people. Mm-hmm. So that was also true. Uh, they're both like blaming the product. We're competing with the, you know, Tableau and ClickView, some bigger vendors that are just, you know, on fire, the IPOs. So maybe the competition is eating our lunch. And that was like uh, very embarrassing and confusing, right? And I said, like, it's, you know, these are like big questions. Why are we winning and losing, right? Why are some people successful, some are not? And and I sent the people to search for data in our CRM system. And they couldn't find anything. So there's nothing there. And then kind of dawned on me that, well, this doesn't make sense. These are... Some key information about why do customers churn? Why do we lose deals? Why do some people fail to succeed? Um, it's all in people's heads. You ask people and you get anecdotes, you get their mm-hmm. opinion. It's the last deal that they lost to competitor because we didn't have that feature, right? Uh, uh, you don't know and you don't have the data. And, and that's why I understood that kind of CRM system were built for the leadership team. They're not built for the customer facing teams. Mm-hmm. They need to put in the information. Uh, they kind of do it reluctantly. They don't love it. Uh, and it was, ends up in this area is like 1% of the data. Mm-hmm. And it's obviously subjective. Mm-hmm. So that was the point where I thought, can we create something that automatically captures like all customer communications and turns it into insights that we understand what's going on without putting the onus on the people. Mm-hmm. Seeing like a, like a, like a uh, full self-driving car, mm-hmm. right? But for customers. Mm-hmm. That feeling of being the adopted parent of SciSense, where you came in not as the founder, how big was the the round that you had just raised? Do you remember the, what the valuation was? Like how good? Like it, I, it, I mean, it, it looked like, like silly these days. Like you know, thirty million at 
180 or something. But things were good. Yeah, things were very good. Yeah, like the business was growing. Yeah. And then when you missed, you used the word embarrassing. Um, Can you just describe that feeling a little bit more? Well, listen, I'm... Meaning like you're calling the board and you have your tail between your legs because you don't have the answers. It's one thing to miss the quarter. Yeah. It's another thing to have zero answers for why. To not know what's going on. Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll say two things. First, I'm a like a high integrity person, right? And again, it's like, there's nothing like funny going on. A very uh, uh, direct. At Gong, we have something called no sugar. Like we talk about problems like very, very openly, like exactly like they are. And I'm a data per- A lot of people don't know that, but I'm actually like an engineer. I wrote code mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm a- Because you're I'm so a, cool. They can't, um, they mistake you for-, for they, <laughs> they, Yeah. People ask me, what people don't know you about this surprise? Yeah, I wrote code. Yeah. Uh, I forget to mention that. Uh, I'm actually like, a, a, they didn't call it a time, but I've, I'm a data scientist. So I, I um, I'm, my degree is in uh, statistics and mm-hmm. computer science. Mm-hmm. So I'm very uh, uh, data driven. I love data. And not knowing- is something that uh, that is like uh, not not something that I'm proud of. First, I, you know, I've rarely like missed a number. I was too pride in like uh, not missing any number. And second, not knowing is is uh, is very hard. Yeah. Why did you decide? What strikes me is that as I've done my homework on you, it always seems like you are predestined to start a company. Like this is what you love to do. And obviously, there was a long buildup that I think was required at Click for you to like maybe earn the credibility, but also the muscle memory of how to do this thing. Why did you wait to be the adopted parent of SciSense before joining, before starting a company rather than just going from Click or Panaya straight into doing your own thing? Like, yeah. Why then? Uh, well, it's a great question. I, I don't know. I didn't have uh, people ask me, did you always know that you want to start a company or a uh, CEO? No, I never had a plan. Yeah. Honestly, I, my curiosity led me over the years from one thing to another, maybe like at a, at a slower pace than usual. So I started the first company. I always joined company like very early, like pre-revenue, mm-hmm. like uh, um, almost all of them are like very little revenue. But there was already like an idea, right, or, or a concept, and it definitely was a company. Uh, Gong was the first one started completely from scratch that I incorporated it, Elon and I. Um, but I just followed from one thing to another, right? I said, oh, I was a CMO. Now, next step is a CEO, right? And that's like an opportunity. It's a good, uh, it was a good opportunity to start with something that already exists. You kind of minimize uh, your your risk factor, you know, this is an existing business. Just need to turn around, and you could uh, uh, you you could learn fairly quickly. But it's not that I say, okay, let's do Sisense first, and then my next thing is start an own company. Mm-hmm. One step at a time. How old were you when you started going? Fifty. Wow. Five zero. It's amazing. Yeah. Were you? Did you get knocked for that? I don't know. Meaning, like um, when you go fundraise, that's not the archetype um, that I don't think so. It's, it's atypical. I I I got. Um, I don't think so. You never know. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. I think there is like you know, there's some time you know you can't start a company. There are people saying if you're not 22, like you can't start a company because you, you know you're not working like 17 hours a day. Uh, I think the th- the thinking has shifted. I'm pretty sure I did get somewhat because I'm, and you know, some people call like white privilege, right? Uh, I'm not, but I, you know, I'm Israeli. I, yeah. you know, I have like uh, uh, grammar mistakes sometimes, and and uh, so I did get some of that, like uh, almost like subconscious. So people say, like you know, you understand here in America, it doesn't work, right? Mm. So I did, I did get some of that ageism. I don't know, not not that I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. But I, I, no, I think most people uh, that I've worked with kind of know my track record and trajectory. So that that was not like a factor. And what about internally for you? Did you knock yourself? Did you worry? Like, God, am I? No, no, not, not even a bit. No. 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 All right. And you've raised uh, $538 million to date. 
from Kotu, Sequoia, Battery, Norwest, blah, blah, blah. $7 billion valuation as of June of 21. Hell of a time to raise money. Yeah. Um, was it always 1,200 employees? 1,300? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, th- employees. Okay. Was it always easy raising money? No. Because it sure looks like it. Yeah, no, paper, it was, sure it was, like uh, you wouldn't believe how hard it was. Nobody wanted to invest in us. Nobody. At the Series A? Seeds, Series A, even Series B was kind of like, yeah. I mean, we, we, we were able to raise, but it definitely wasn't like, uh, we got a lot of no's. I don't want to know the answer to this. Did you talk to Clyde Perkins? Uh, yes, yes, <sighs> but we, it's, yeah, I can't remember like the uh, the previous partner that he was in. Uh, I think it was in, like Palo Alto or something. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not alone. Like nobody <sighs> wanted to invest, and there are people like who said no to the A and came to the B. People say no to the B and came invested in the sure. C. So and and you know at a higher multiple, but. Why was the did the business metrics look shitty when you were trying to raise the seed in the end? No, they're great, they're great. Uh, so it's a bunch of things, right? Uh, so first they said, okay, there is no, um, and again, all smart people. Nobody is like stupid. Like all people that that I know and know me were good friends, right? So and it should be like a walk in the park. Done. Still couldn't get it done. Uh, and and Dror is a partner in our West. Says this is like actually like the hardest deal for me to pass the partnership, because like you said, sometimes I can get some of these like uh, you know this esoteric hyper tensor technology that nobody knows anything about. But you know the you know the founder worked at VMware, so they say okay, like that's fine. Now you talk about sales. It's like psychology and marketing, right? Now that everybody thinks that they understand, right? Every partner thinks that they understand sales, mm-hmm. right? So they said, uh, salespeople are going to hate it. Recording, like, seriously, how can you do that? Uh, Google and Amazon are going to own that space. Um, there hasn't been like any company that is, uh, uh, that has been successful in the sales space, which, which is true. Like uh, up until then, like, I think there was like uh, some companies were burnt with like investment that didn't uh, didn't become like substantial companies. So all of these were uh, some didn't think that the technology would work. Um, so we got a lot of uh, a lot of resistance. Is there a metaphor that you can use for what Gong did in the market with previous companies? Um, like, are there any comps of what? You guys well, did with previous companies in an, er- an era before you. Yeah. Um, so you can think of Gong as like as like Google for enterprise. This is this is what it is. So Google, you know, someone you might not know had a predecessor who was a Yahoo, right? Yahoo was a human curated uh, uh, directory, right? So if you wanted to know what the top twelve pizza joints in San Francisco are, they're actually people doing the taxonomies and, and the, the labelings, right? If I and Google came and says, forget it. Like we're gonna do everything automatically. We're gonna index the world's information like without humans in the equation, created something that's like a hundred times bigger, like way more information, and then on top of that, they build the application. This is what Gong does to traditional SaaS applications. We started with the um, CRM, right? Which again is like um, a human curated system where people put in information. We're using AI to capture a lot more data and pre- uh, provide a lot more meaning. And we're seeing it in other areas, in uh, in uh, in recruiting, in project management, in a lot of other areas. Everywhere that requires human input. That's probably like uh, going away. So it's it's a really uh, transformational technology. We didn't re- recognize like back then how big it could get. Was it weird for you uh, in the last two years, given what you saw from the early day? Like you have the battle wounds and scars, knowing like what the hell? Like that, like we have good business metrics and we can't raise money. And I imagine in the later rounds. There was, you know, people were begging to be on the capital. Yeah, yeah. Was that surreal? Um, it was not surreal. Like, and, and again, I never had like hard feelings. I totally understood what people sure. said at the time. Sure. It was, it was reasonable, right? Sometimes the distance between like uh, stupidity and uh, and uh, brilliance is kind of hard to tell. Yeah, right. No it's doubt. Like, uh, yeah, how many people passed on Google? Yeah, right. It's like, uh, yeah. 
or thought that Tesla is in, is going to fail. Uh, yeah. it, it's a high risk, a very ambitious project. No. So I was just kind of taking the prize. I actually told people and we have it recorded on all hands, like, you know, let Let's not drink our Kool-Aid. This is like valuation. It's not something we celebrate. We celebrate the number of customers, the number of employees. These are the real metrics that that uh, matter to to a company. It's all we're raising, not for the valuation. We're raising and um, um, to have the money for a rainy day. Mm-hmm. Because I knew from 2000 and 2008 that, you know, it's just a matter of time. It will come. So, mm-hmm. Um. I have been told that you, what are gongs like company colors? Purple, purple? And fuchsia, yeah. And fuchsia? Yeah. Okay, so you bleed purple and fuchsia. Like the, you are the company that, and you represent, you are the number one spokesperson representative for the company. Um, is do, when you are so all in, does distinguishing between Amit, the dad, husband, whatever it is, musician, and the CEO of the company, does it do, do those lines start to blur for you, or is it easy for you to pull away? Uh, of course, they blur. I mean, you can't distinguish because, like, um, people think like you know, brand and culture are not something that you pay an agency to define and create a poster. It's how you act, who you are, how you behave. It's your body language more than anything, right? So. Um, your personality, right? If you're uh, one of my my VP says, like I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to be beige like ever, right? So your personality, if you're beige, people can tell you, you know, you, fuchsia doesn't doesn't suit you, right? So it's how you act, and uh, and you tend to hire people. Kind of follow either you kind of hire people that are that find a proposition attractive. So the people at Gong probably didn't find at least like a, um, and then they see you and your leaders follow you and everybody else. So that's what the uh, culture and behavior and, and brand uh, is all about. I've never thought about it in this way until you just started talking, but Gong's clear superpower, one of them is marketing um, for sure. The brand of the business is uh, in a league of its own and I wonder if so much of that comes from the amount of personality of the founders of the team that you allow to kind of shine through into the brand. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's multi-level. First, I think that uh, people buy from people, right? And people think that, you, you know, if you're like in an enterprise software, you need to be like fully buttoned up, very formal. And um, and people like to buy from people. They like like a person, not uh, kind of a logo or a brand. That's what they interact. Uh, we always took cue from the great like uh, consumer marketing uh, products. We were like you know like Apple and Tesla more than some of the like a, like an IBM, right? Mm-hmm. It's never like our role model. We 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 hate it actually. And and second. Um, I allow a lot of people and I encourage a lot of people to shine. So you'll see a lot of the uh, the gong people. We have like celebrities that are that are bigger than me, right? I, I remember like I was uh, I was um, at a customer event and I was like, hey, I meet Fina. I said, hey, nice to meet you. Like, where is like Sheena, right? And it's like uh, mm-hmm. she because she's big on a podcast and she's revealed. So, uh, I mean, that, that's great that a lot of people like find their own personal brand uh, within the company and, and they help us grow as well. I was with um, Parker Conrad, the Rippling yeah. founder, um, and one of the things that we were talking about that made me think of you is, and he said this in another podcast, and I just found it fascinating, and I'd never heard about it. I've never thought about it in this way until he said it, which was, imagine building a company is like your favorite sport, and you just love being on the field, playing the sport. Right. And I'd never thought about company building in that way. That's how I feel when I work. That's how I feel at Kleiner when I work with our portfolio. Yep. That's how I felt when I was at startups. And I had a really hard time explaining to people how this, like in some weird way, their blinds are so blurred 
because I love it. And when you make the sports metaphor, it makes a lot of sense. Does that make sense to you? A- absolutely. And and we've actually used that in Gong. So I, we have like, a, I likened, um, so I'd say like, you know, we're big soccer fans like in Israel and mm-hmm. in, in my family, we, you know, we watch the games. And first you do it for the love of the game, right? And again, it's not, people don't do it for money. You just, you do something that you enjoy. Second, uh, it's about teams, right? At Gong, we have like win as a team. And again, it's not like be a team player. That's like a, you know, like a, that's a cliche. Win as a team. You'd see that whenever you ask for help, people are, are will be happy to help you. Like, and I saw like from the early days and, you know, we're, we're Barcelona fans in our home. Like in the days where like, I mean, maybe mm-hmm. they don't have their best season right now, but in days where good, you see that the passing the ball is just awesome right how it goes and how everybody like succeeds as a team it's not about like you know like a like now cristiano ronaldo is like one player or lebron that it's like everybody like serves him like mm-hmm. so like barcelona it's like an you know, all-star team like everybody was like amazing at what they did and you see the ball passing that's uh that's what i strive to do to create like an all-star team that everybody's amazing and everybody's like passing the ball and having a blast do you think that creates a superpower weapon for the for the company? Like, uh, meaning, it's very obvious to me that you do it for the love of the game, and I say that because um, it's not about. It does not feel like it's about the money. Uh, like you're wearing an iPhone one, basically, yeah. like an like a, like like the the iWatch. Whatever, what is it? The Apple Watch. It's literally like a, this, I, like this, a, oh, this is a Garmin. That's a it's Garmin. It's not a Rolex. Yeah, it's, it's a Garmin. It's, a, it's not even it's the a Garmin. Uh, it's, it's a chip and it looks model, like yeah. an Apple Watch. I can't yeah. even tell the difference. And like you know, like I feel like that shirt you wear around the house. Like I, I just don't feel like there's any level of anything other than you know you just like that's what you wore because you're going to go to work. Like it's not even a thought for you. Um, and I feel like that's very pure. And I feel like when your intent is so pure, that means something. That means something to the people that work for you. Yeah, we, we try to be uh, genuine. So, you know, I have like pizza with the team, right? It's like that's that's what we do. And it's not that we, you know, we serve like caviar at Gong or anything. It's never about the, uh, those, you know, novelties. We just enjoy the game. We, we enjoy the ride. We try to have fun. You ask about the colors or a lot of the, uh, the brand. Um, one of our operating principles, I think we're going to touch almost as like enjoy the ride, mm. which means like we're dead serious about our work, but we don't take ourselves like too seriously. Yeah, we could have a fun. We could be funny. We could we could tell a joke and it's it's never formal. But let me ask you this. Have you so have you always felt that way? Have you yeah. always been able to enjoy the ride? Yeah, especially when it's your, um, I've always enjoyed the call, but when companies that I've not started from scratch, sometimes you come into like an existing culture, yeah. but yeah, definitely when I was a CEO, it was like uh, fun and, and I did enjoy like even in other companies, like yeah. you, you don't fully shape the culture. Maybe what I'm trying to get at is I wonder when you're having the quarter from hell at SciSense, are you still enjoying the ride in the same way that, you know, post series yeah. E or series D from Co2? You know, I mean, easier said than done, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that that wasn't fun. That was like a, that was like a stressful, stressful time. Uh, th- there are times uh, like you know, two thousand the dot com bust was terrible. Like it was really like uh, uh, frightening. Yeah, and um, and I, even like I, I ran a, uh, I did like an internal party of six at the company. We're discussing people that uh, gone through two thousand and two thousand eight. And versus uh, and, and and others that are kind of under thirty four that have not been through a crisis that all seems like up or to the right. So yeah. we've had that conversation to sir to discuss times that aren't fun. Yeah, right. M- yeah. My point is, um, it, this doesn't feel like an accident. And you know, you're on. You have all these accolades, like you're on the number two number two startup, like to culture work for whatever. And a lot of people think those are kind of like college ratings where you pay to play for those. And no. it, it's like, this is legit. Like this is coming from a place where you just showed me, you know, you're spending time every day memorizing BDR's names before you meet with them. Yeah. It's legit. I really appreciate that. And I admire it. Um, what was a point um, in Gong that you felt like you struggled the most? Um, well, it comes to go in your early days. Um, 
people did not want to buy from us. We had like a we had like a, a few that kind of did us a favor in the early days, but then it was you know people said, oh, it's expensive. I got uh, you know a lot of other projects uh, until we learned how to sell it properly. We had like a, a neck to neck competition in the early days that was like you know we're almost like at a even like at somewhat of a disadvantage like in the early days so we're you know losing your first deal to competition is hard and you don't know maybe they'll you know they'll eat us or something until we're able to get on a roll and 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 uh build the uh the competitive gap uh and even these times right now it's like challenging for uh for everybody it's again it's like uh what's going on around us and and to our customers and all of us these are you know, startup is a roller coaster ride, but we had, we had, I don't want to like, uh, share like horror. There's no horror stories. Like it's been a fairly smooth rise. There is no, yeah. never at a point where like, you know, those cool stories, like, you know, the pivot or anything yeah, else. Yeah. It's like, and I told people, so our story is like pretty boring. Like what we thought is pretty much where we are and yeah. even better. Like I can't tell you all these like twists and turns. Yeah. I had uh, Michelle Zaitlin, the co-founder of Cloudflare on this morning, and she was saying the same thing. She's like, look, I don't have the good Hollywood, like terrible pivot yeah, story yeah. for you. And yeah, I get that. Um, I um, There's a story that I'm hoping you can share. All um, right. It's uh, you... Um, you got in a car accident after you went swimming. <laughs> Can you share the story? Yeah, I share it with people, you know, so when, when I take like the uh, the team to captain's table, right? And, uh, and you know, we share like embarrassing stories. So this is one. I have two that I, that I alternate between. But uh, this was a period where um, I think I was like in my uh, early 40s, kind of like a midlife crisis. I was like not in good shape, somewhat overweight. And my wife told me, oh, this friend of mine started like a triathlon group. He says, oh, that's great. And I was like in, in when I was like a, a child and a teenager, I was I was in in a swim team and that's that was my thing. So I said, okay, let's go. And uh, so I was starting to swim like every day. And there's this place near a house. And um, and uh, so I went there like early morning. I didn't take anything on me. Like it's just just me, the flip flops, the speedo, and a towel, right? No driver's license, not even a phone. I don't think so. Not even a t-shirt. Yeah, uh, not even a t-shirt, and it wasn't like a pretty sight. Uh, <laughs> you mean and, you the speedo? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think this uh, this was the first time that I did like uh, on that day. So it's just the, I just started training, and I did like three thousand meters laps. It's oh. That's I felt wow, we're back in business, right? It's like uh <laughs> um and it must have been like the adrenaline or something. So I you know, I drive home and all of a sudden I get hit by a by a pickup truck. This car starts spinning, uh airbags go off, uh the glasses are smashed. And you know, I was okay, but it was kind of like uh kind of in a shock, right? I didn't know what's going on. It was almost like a like everything was in slow down and I go out and there I am in the middle of the junction, uh, shattered glass, like across, across the <laughs> road, uh, police shows up the other car. I mean, they weren't like seriously injured, but I think it's, they got like the, uh, the whiplash or something. So they had an ambulance come and take them. It's like elderly people. And the, uh, the policeman, uh, the police officer comes in and I can I see the driver's license. Uh, so, uh, I left it at home. Say, so, okay, can you, uh, maybe like call someone? So I don't have my phone. So I, I go to this like total stranger. <laughs> can you imagine the size? Uh, would it you is, mind if I use your phone? It so it is like overweight, like a uh, person, like in a speedo asking her for a phone. So I'm calling my wife. Calling like two or three times. Turns out it's like 8 a.m. She was at a yoga class. She's not picking up. And then, uh, then she, um, on, uh, she leaves the class. She see like unanswered phone calls. She calls back and says, Oh, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's so and so. Your husband was uh, involved in a car accident. Like he's over there and it says, He's okay. Don't worry. So she rushes. And then I see her like from the distance, like in her car. She sees me in a speedo. She grabs her head and says, "Oh my God, yeah, I know." She let, let me drive home. I'll get you like a like the pants right uh, first thing. So that was like, yeah. She fortunately she's still with me. 
Well, it's a sight. I, I definitely like remember the visuals. I I am gonna ask her if there's a picture somewhere. There's got to be a picture. Fortunately somewhere. not. Fortunately <laughs> not. Maybe they're like street street grammars or something. Well, uh, yeah. you said there was another embarrassing story uh, about me abandoning her and our one year old like uh, out there in a cold. I've never. I haven't in heard the this. snow to freeze. No. Uh, all right. That's. Uh, Do you want to share it? You don't have to. Yeah, sorry, honey, if you're if you're listening, but uh, she didn't even we remember that we're we're still together. So I think we're we're like there's one time went to his like toy store uh, with our one year old. He loves to play with like Thomas the uh, the tank engines, and they had this table. And I'm you know we're having fun. It was like, winter in Boston, right? It was like snowing outside, and I wanted to spare them kind of the um, uh, the walk from the store to the car. So let me go pick up the car, and you wait for me here. And I go and pick up the car and they wait and wait and wait and wait. And then she calls me like, where are you? And I was like, an, uh, it turns out I was like an autopilot on my way home. <laughs> it happens when you're occupied and uh, yeah. How often does that happen to you where your brain can't stop? My brain can't stop. It's always like thinking of something. That's how it always is. Yeah, it's always it's always like on. Like, Do you uh, think yeah. that's a feature or a bug? Both. Both. It's it's definitely a bug. Sometimes you talk with someone and you can see your mind meanders. Uh, it was like in university, it was hard for me to listen, right? Uh, so especially like long monologues are kind of challenging. So university, if there is like, you know, to talk about, you know, set theory or probability, you know, 10 minutes and I'm I'm zoned out. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you that actually, like it, it, it actually uh, ties nicely into into Gong. Uh, so I always like uh, when I talk with people. Sometimes I'll, I'll think about stuff, right? But I, I do it all the time. I do it when you know in the shower. I do it like when I drive. I do it when whenever I um, uh, whatever I'm doing. But you come up with ideas all the time. Yeah, that's like uh, that's the power. Yeah, I, I'm the same way, and it gets to the point where. I'll be in the shower and I forget if I washed my body. Like I, yeah, I, I have yeah. no idea what yeah. just happened. Yeah. Like I'm so far gone. Right. Sometimes I'll go and try to uh, bring something from the kitchen and then, you know, halfway there, like, wait a minute, like what was I looking for? Like, yeah. The, the other problem that I run into is I have zero ability to hide it. It's almost like when my brain starts turning on, it's all over my face. And so if I'm in the middle of a conversation, it's so clear when my brain is somewhere else. Yeah, you know, my, I, my, my wife knows that. She she'll recognize like it. I'm not, like I'm not even aware. I'm not even aware myself. But she said, "Oh, where are you?" Like, do you um do you worry that? So maybe this is just selfish line of questioning now. But I, I've been asking myself if this is a feature or a bug for a long time now, and I I, I believe channeled appropriately, it's it's good and healthy. Um, but it's it can drive me crazy. It drives me a little bit nuts. Does it drive you nuts? It doesn't drive me nuts. I don't like when uh, when you talk with someone and and they feel you're not paying attention. Yeah. Like so, I, I try. I'm mindful of that, and that's what I try to control with myself. No, I don't mind like going like in all different direction when I'm on my own. Do you have the ability to just sit and focus on things for long blocks of time? Yes. Yes. I could. I could. I could do when I set my mind to it, and when I'm focused, and and I have like a, a tunnel vision. Um, and, and again, it has to be something like uh, very interesting and, and compelling to me. If it's something boring, uh, that, that'll be more of a challenge. Yeah. But I imagine a lot of your time is just spent thinking about gong. Oh yeah. Most of the time is about gong. Like even when you're whatever, doing whatever, yeah. it's just about gong. Yeah. And I guess you love it. So it's not like a big deal. No, it's it's definitely interesting, and and you know sometimes I'll shoot people like emails in the middle of the night or, or Slack, right? And again, I don't expect them to read, but just don't want to forget it because you know, I'm already moving on to the next thing. So I might text like alone, hey, what do you think about this product idea or that product idea? And then just remind me to talk about it when we speak next. So I always like send these notes. So and then I just uh, just move on. I, I read, you know, definitely and think about stuff like Beyond Gong as well, but. Uh, Definitely Gong is is at the top. You know what I find an interesting paradox about you is that you um, have started a AI company that is automating go-to-market and sales intelligence, okay? Yeah. Yet, you are so focused 
on the personal human relationships. Doesn't that strike you as interesting? Like it is yeah, kind of it's um I look at it as a, as a creation. So I don't know if you know, I, I always wanted to be like an artist, right? That was like when I was a child, I wanted to be like a musician or something. And 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 I think there's there's something common to both like creating companies or whether like visual arts or music or or writing a book. You want people to be moved, right? You want to create something that that is great. And uh, and when you create a product that people rave about, I mean that's the uh, that's the highest reward. And when you create a company that people want to work for, that's the highest reward. So, I I um, actually you know we started with salespeople. I think one of the reasons Gong was so successful because we I understood the persona like very well. I understood you know what they like what. They don't like technology, uh, how easy it needs to be, what motivates them. And then we got to that uh, wow factor. So there's no there's no contradiction. And AI uh, does not replace people. It replaces some of the chores that, uh, you know, that they hate anyway. So everybody wins. On the AI piece, we have seen some of the most exciting advances in AI technology. Um, uh, you know, to the point where some people might even believe it's over bubbled right now. It's overhyped in this moment, which I don't know. It's pretty incredible. I'm really curious building the AI company that you're building. What do you make of this? What do you make of what's happening? I don't think it's overhyped. I think most people like underestimate the uh, the potential uh, and and understand uh, even after you know what we saw now with the. Uh, uh, GPT chat is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Can you explain to the audience what what that is, what it's doing? So this is called like a a generative transform from OpenAI and there there are other like, you know, Lambda from Google and other uh, technologies that does that. Basically, it's a large language model. So it it kind of read like all the documents in the world that are public domain, like Wikipedia and and websites and, and other sources. And then in natural language, you can ask him, um, questions like, um, can you write a short essay on the U.S. Uh, revolution or constitution or pros and cons? And it'll just create it for you. So that's that's uh, very powerful. Anything from poems to uh, recipes to essays, uh, it can generate text. So that's uh, that's pretty powerful. And I was actually using it tongue in cheek. So we had uh, like an all hands call um last week and i said can you create like a 300 word opening for me it talks about like macroeconomics challenges about how we grow the new products all of that and it did an incredible job but you know almost my job was made redundant Mm. and why is that so exciting um first the um it works very well so kind of the premise was always there but to see a product actually works like very well uh is is uh is exciting progress. I think we still have a lot of like uh, a lot of work to do because it could get a lot more a lot more powerful. What we're seeing right now is kind of to do stuff that people can do with a lot of work and much shorter, faster. So it's definitely like a, a productivity, and you know we could turn from creators to kind of like editors. Uh, you know, my interest is can it do stuff that people cannot do like no matter what right in a way it's like much more powerful i think that's uh that's the uh the open frontier like what what's an example of something that we're not thinking of today that you think could be an exciting development um this is not, will sound like a little far-fetched i said i think about gong so i i've been uh thinking you know last year about things that we cannot know right so so here's um there are things that we don't know. We don't know how to cure cancer, but I think we we'll probably will, right? I don't know if it takes like 10 years or 100 years or 200 years, but these are things that, you know, almost certainly, you know, we will, we will figure it out. But our brain is kind of where the most advanced primate, right, is not infinitely capable, right? It's probably the most capable of like you, uh, species that live on the face of the earth, but it's not like a, the most powerful machine conceivable. So if you take a dog, for example, 
there's stuff that they don't know, like, you know, sit, go, uh, uh, you know, stay, right? But differential equations, there is not, they will never be able to process that. They just can't grasp. And so it's possible, and I think probable, that, that there are stuff that we cannot know, right? Even like... Um, Maybe you already have some of that, like quantum mechanics, for example, right? Richard Feynman is like one of the fathers of the mm -hmm. theory. He said like, yeah, I get the math, the equations, but I don't fully understand it or things like entanglement. So we're already on the verge of things that are, uh, might be hard to grasp and then to uh, get to like advanced concept of how the universe really works. Um, there, it's possible that uh, it's just unknowable to us. And this is where machines could play. You know, if you could like crack um how the universe works and and learn more um so we made like a good progress you know since like newton like you know 300 years like made like a big jump imagine how much more uh we can learn if we can use uh ai to do stuff that we cannot and and will never be able to yeah uh in my world some of the um analogies that people are using is imagine the iPhone plus cloud combined is the magnitude of what people believe this opportunity could be yeah. in the in the way that this technology is breaking through at the rate that it's improving right now and compounding. Yeah, I mean that that's kind of happening that you got to your your all the knowledge is available, you know, your your fingertip right now. I think I think it could be like way bigger if you think kind of the uh, um how how it all works and the, the the universe and the, the amount of like energy that is in the world you know you could tap in like a, things that are a lot more powerful that kind of hard hard to imagine we tend to extrapolate things like from based on stuff that we know right uh, uh but this could make like a big jump in ways that are non-linear and and not fully predictable and do you worry or get excited about applying some of these things to gong um, I get excited. I get excited. You always need to worry because like, you know, once technology available, if we're not like at the front, then, you know, it makes it easier for other people to develop it. So we're not necessarily the only one. That's why we have to be like on the edge, but we have a long-term vision and we spoke about like uh, almost equivalent of a, uh, of a full self-driving car. We're not completely there because, you know, we don't necessarily understand everything that's being said, you know, we're sent to a good degree, but it's not, it's not hundred percent. And how to drive action automatically is something that still uh, is is a constant area of research, and and it's possible uh, by the current investment. I think if we started, you know, we started think about Gong in 2015. We really launched the company in 2016. Have we started uh, two or three years before that? We probably would not have been successful because just the technology wasn't wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were redoing, if you were redoing the company from scratch, knowing what you know, what are some things you would have done differently? And, uh -huh. and please don't answer nothing. I regret nothing because no. there's always ways to improve. Right. Um, I, I said, I started like pretty linear. Um, so, you know, it's like being like a, like a Monday morning quarterback or something. Right. But, um, I think some of the things we could have done faster. Uh, so there is like uh, some products that we have. Um, we almost like wasted a year. With internal discussions uh, of, you know, what should the colors be or what should that be or should we do it this way, that way, kind of discussing in the office versus, out, you know, get something out there, get the customer uh, feedback, iterate quickly. So. We probably could, we probably lost a year of of, of uh, uh, time to market on uh, on certain products, and we, we could have done them faster. Um, I don't know. And time time will tell. Yeah. Some 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 things are easier to tell in hindsight. Yeah. Right? And uh, yeah, I guess we will tell. I'm excited yeah. to see. Are you? Um, you don't strike me as tired. Meaning like you started the company uh, at an older age, you've been at this company for eight, nine years now, which is, um, you know, and you're going to be Seven. at it. It's a while and you're going to be at it for like, you're not going to, you're not going public this year. 
No, 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 no one's going public right no. now. Right. So, <laughs> so, and even when you achieve that milestone, that's in a lot of ways, kind of just the beginning, right? It's a long journey. And the way that I describe startups is that it's at its most simple form, problem solving sequentially in perpetuity. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. It's just solving problems over and over again. And, and again, I know that's a very overly simplistic definition, but if you take that definition and you do that for eight years, that's a lot of problem solving. That is hard. And the things that hit your desk now are not the easy problems. They're the hard ones. Right. And so it actually gets harder in some ways. Um, I'm just, maybe this is more of a comment that I'd love your, um, your reaction to, but you don't strike me as tired. I'm not tired. I actually do not see my role as solving problems. Mm. I do solve problems every day. Uh, what excites me and keeps me going is pursuing opportunities. So my focus on, you know, what are we creating? What's exciting? And, and I, I have like a vision that I would like. It's, it's a creation, right? Something like art that I want to see it working, right? It's a product. That's, uh, uh, that's the motivation. And you kind of solve problems like along the ways. Uh, uh, so like in every day, there's, you know, I get probably like hundreds of emails. Uh, you know, half of them are good and half of them are not good. Uh, that's like always like there's a problem here, there's a problem there, but there's also something in the client that, that balances. But uh, yeah, you have to have like a purpose and, and a goal and it allows you to deal with a lot of product because what you're doing is hard. Like, uh, it's, it's very hard. It's definitely not for the faint of art. But uh, um, uh, no, I'm not feeling tired at all. Yeah, it's exciting, man. It, it's, uh, you make me very optimistic about company building. Yeah, it's a long journey. That's what you, and, and like, uh, I even told the company, ever said, when is the IPO? And when is the IPO? Like, in, it, like even like uh, last year. So like, listen, uh, IPO, I think it's, it's a milestone. I think it's, it's a pretty cool event. Right. It's not a destination. Right. It's it's like like marriage. You know, it's the wedding is one thing that's pretty cool, but it's actually the life thereafter. And it has to be like solid and and healthy and and uh, enriching. Right. And the work actually kind of just begins. in that, Oh, in it's, that marriage. it's more work. Yeah. So, you know, if you're like public right now, you know, probably I have to deal with all the outside pressures and the press and, and the ticker prices. Uh, so. Yeah, definitely the journey, the long-term vision, uh, what keeps uh, me energized. And you solve problems along the way. This is a weird question, but do you does work stress you out? Uh, no, no, honestly, no. I know it's hard to believe. I, I believe it. Yeah. Um, first, you know, I'm in my fifties. I've I've done a lot, uh, and nothing like uh, very few. Things scare me and I know that, you know, this has to succeed and I was like, don't mind like consequences, all that. So I know that we will succeed. That's one. Second, um, I'm blessed with a really strong leadership team that actually um, I could probably like take like 60 days off right now and everything will just work. Yeah, they'll miss me, but they'll, they'll, they'll do fine. So uh, building a great team uh helps uh keep things in control and and running and um yeah there's there's nothing like there, there are challenges they're real it's not that i don't see them i see them and and i and i address them and respond to them but they don't scare me and when you see a big challenge i know you see opportunities but i know you see challenges too yeah. when you see a big problem what does it feel like on the inside if it's not stress I like how do you interpret I, the problem? I, I, I act. I I I actually even like enjoy that, right? In in a weird way, and I know it might not sound genuine, but I, I think when there's a problem, there's an opportunity to uh, respond quickly and with intensity and ferocity, right? That people sometimes uh, uh, forget. So it's always like it's like a thrill ride, right? It's like you enjoy the highs and the lows and, and everything. If you if you take a little bit of an outside view and if you if you act, that's that's a great feeling. It really is an artistic view of company building. 
Uh, yeah, well, I told you that that's what I always wanted to be. Maybe one day I'll get into art. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good. Well, I think we have an episode title. I uh, I appreciate you. I, I really do. I'm just really happy that we got to do this. Um, I generally um, I generally end these things the same way. I say generally. I've never not ended it the same way. Okay. Uh, the the first is, are you hiring? If you are hiring, are there any key roles that you're hiring for that you want to use this platform to to talk about or shout out? We are hiring at a slower pace, so we have a few positions. I don't even know what. Uh, okay. um, it's probably on the Gong careers hiring. page. It's on the Gong's career page, so check it out. There's something that that, that um, is a good fit for you. We would love for you to to apply, and feel free to reach out to me or, or, or the uh, the hiring team. Um, and in all positions, in engineering, in sales, in marketing, and and uh, finance, I think. Hmm. Hmm. Um. What does the word grit mean to you? What do you think of when you hear that word? Grit um, is, I, I think it's the uh, um, desire to succeed far outweighs the adversity and friction uh, that gets in the way. I mean, thank you. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's just fun. Thank you.